Okay, as we continue this week in Joshua chapter 7, the subject is still Achan, the, the battle for the city of Ai, and the law of Harem. Now, this principle of Harem, in English usually called the ban, B-A-N, ban, is so pervasive in the Bible that it would be proper to speak of it as a pattern as well as a principle. And this pattern shows up in some very unlikely places. For instance, it is said that the Levitical sacrificial system is based primarily on two things. The requirement of blood for atonement of sins and the provision within God's justice system to substitute the life of an innocent animal for the life of a guilty man. But there's also a third foundational element present in the makeup of the sacrificial system the principle of the ban. Now, the law of the ban is that banned things are things that God has declared are His holy property. The English word ban is chosen to translate the Hebrew harem because the idea is that to ban something means to dedicate something exclusively to the Lord, therefore to disallow its use by any human or perhaps at the least to restrict access to anything that is banned. Now, while ban, the law of harem, is technically an ordinance that pertains to holy war and most directly affects the disposition of the spoils of war taken from an enemy, as we see here in Joshua, the overall principle is based on the concept that property devoted to God becomes God's holy property. And that holy property becomes untouchable. And anyone who would dare to misappropriate God's holy property or use it in an unauthorized way would pay the consequence, usually, of forfeiting their life. Now, this may sound like a simple matter of criminality, that the person who partakes of the banned property, God's declared holy property, has broken the law. And so the lawbreaker is subject to the curse of the law, that is, the prescribed punishment. In other words, it's no different than if a person had stolen the banned property, who had stolen the brand property, had murdered somebody, or raped, or committed adultery. You break a law, you pay a price. But as we near the end of Joshua chapter 7, we're going to find that the matter was far more about the Lord protecting His holiness than about someone committing an intentional and serious sin. So, let's open our Bibles to Joshua chapter 7, and we'll start reading at verse 16. Joshua chapter 7, we'll start reading at verse 16. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, that's page 248. 248. Joshua chapter 7, beginning at verse 16, and we'll go on to the end. So Joshua got up early in the morning, and he had Israel come forward one tribe at a time, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he had the families of Judah come forward and took the family of Zarhi, and he had the Zarhi family come forward by households, and Zabdi was taken, and he had his household come forward one person at a time, and Akan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerach of the tribe of Judah was taken. And Joshua said to Achan, My son, swear to Adonai, the God of Israel, that you will tell the truth and confess to him. Tell me now, what did you do? And don't hide anything from me. And Achan answered Joshua, It's true. I've sinned against Adonai, the God of Israel, and here is exactly what I did. When I saw, uh, when I saw there with the spoil a beautiful robe from Shinar, five pounds of sil- silver shekels and a one and a, half, one and a quarter pound wedge of gold, I really wanted them, so I took them, and you'll find them hidden in the ground beside, inside my tent with the silver underneath. And Joshua sent messengers who ran to the tent. It was all there, hidden in his tent, including the silver underneath. And they took the things from inside the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the people of Israel, and put them, be, put them down before Adonai. And Joshua, together with all Israel, took a con, the son of Zerach, with the silver, his, the robe, the gold wedge, his sons, his daughters, his cattle, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, everything he had, brought them up to the Akor Valley. And Joshua said, why have you brought trouble on us? 
Today Adonai will bring trouble on you. And then all of Israel stoned him to death. They burned them to ashes and stoned them. And over him they piled a great mound of stones, which is there to this day. Finally, God turned away from his fierce anger. And this is why that place is called the Valley of Accor, trouble to this day. Now, I told you last week that in this search for the culprit that absconded with the Lord's spoils of war, and it turned out to be this Ekan guy, that we weren't witnessing a trial. Now, allow me to amend that statement just a little bit by saying that this is not a humanly run trial using normal legal procedures decided by a human judge. Rather, this was a heavenly trial run by God. And God is the victim, he's the accuser, he's the witness, and he's the judge. This was not a human trial brought about by human discovery in which, by means of investigation, the goal was to ascertain the truth and then to ferret out the responsible party. Rather, this was a divine proceeding in which the Lord, who already knew the guilty party with certainty, was going to supernaturally reveal the identity of this guilty person to the officials of Israel so they could take proper consequence against him, thus satisfying God's justice and then living the con lifting that consequence off of Israel's back. So what we see in verses 16 through 18 is a winnowing process, if you would, of all 12 tribes coming forward, then from all the tribes, one tribe, Judah, is identified. And then from Judah, its clans are screened until one, one clan is separated out. And then from the chosen clan families, from the chosen clan families are chosen, and they're questioned. And then finally, from the selected families, the heads of the household are all marched forward until the guilty one is revealed. And the details of the procedure that we really don't have spelled out for us are that lots are being drawn at each stage of the winnowing process is the method that the Lord uses to communicate to Joshua and Israel who that criminal is. Now, the thought of lots being used to determine guilt or innocence probably would unnerve us today. I think it would me. And especially in our democratic society. But again, remember, this was a divine proceeding. No man was even aware that a serious trespass had occurred. And thus, no man had accused anyone of anything. Therefore, in the law of Moses, we don't find that drawing lots is used as a means to come to a judicial decision when the crime is human upon human. It's not done that way. However, here in Joshua, the crime, was uh, crime that was perpetrated by Achan was human upon God. No human was harmed or violated, per se. Only the Lord. Therefore, the means of arriving at a just decision is different. So while in a human trial, witnesses are needed to present evidence and, and, and mount a case against the accused in this direct violation of God's holy property by a con, the procedure has nothing to do with determining guilt or innocence. It is only about Jehovah revealing the guilty party to the human authorities. You see the difference? Now let me remind you that all of this Lot drawing was happening because a calamity of sorts had just occurred. Israel's army had been routed when they attempted to conquer the Canaanite city of Ai, and 36 Israelite soldiers had been killed. And as a result, Joshua was in a state of shock. The people were scared. They were demoralized because this was not supposed to happen. And God was angry. The Lord was demonstrating to Joshua, and I think to us, that the problem that led to Israel's defeat was not necessarily 
a poor battle strategy, or even execution of a plan. Rather, it was that Israel had become arrogant. They had become self-confident after their easy victory over Jericho. But it was also that not everything went well and in accordance with God's instructions at Jericho. Now, this was unbeknownst to, to Joshua. At Jericho, a great sin against God had occurred in secret. A member of Israel took some of the banned property in Jericho, and this was the underlying reason for Israel's defeat at Ai. Now, this gives me an opportunity to remind you of something that just drives modern Christians, primarily Western Christians like us, to anger and denial. The Lord had assigned a kind of communal responsibility upon all Israel for the sin of this one man, Akan. I want to explore that for a few minutes. I did not say that the communal guilt was upon all Israel. Because the Lord did not say that in his eyes, every Israelite was guilty of trespass against him because of what Akan had done in secret. Not guilt. But every member of Israel was now under the burden of the consequences for this one man's sin. Do you see the difference? Does that concept bother you? I mean, I've heard so many pastors and teachers say that while that reality may have been so in the Old Testament era, in the New Testament era, it's all changed, and no one is responsible or bears the burden except for his or her own sins. Wrong. No, it's not true. Now, first, that assumption the problem with that assumption is it theologically mixes apples and oranges. And the subject is a very complex one that can only be properly explained in the Torah because it's only barely lightly touched upon in the New Testament. See, it's one thing to be held guilty for another man's sins. It's quite another to find yourself bearing a consequence caused by another man's sins. And as I just explained, it's the latter situation that's being demonstrated here in Joshua 7. However, don't think that the former possibility is a thing of the past. Can we be held guilty as individuals before the Lord for the sin of our Father? Yes. The Father of everybody in this room is who? Adam. And since the day our original parents, who's our original parents? Everybody in here. Adam and Eve. Since the day our original parents sinned, we have all borne their guilt. Every one of us. It's the overwhelming reason we need a Messiah in the first place. All over and over again. We're told in the scriptures that we were conceived in sin as a result of Adam's original sin and that we bear personal guilt because Adam is our father. The only people in existence who do not bear the guilt of Adam's sin are those who place their faith in Yeshua. Because it was Messiah Yeshua's divine purpose to remedy this situation for everyone who trusts in him. His blood did something that the blood of no bull or goat could ever do or ever in history did. Atone for the guilt. The guilt of Adam. It became our communal guilt. Theologians call that particular kind or category of sin and guilt the sin nature. 
That is, when Adam sinned, something within his spiritual DNA became corrupted. And it had a negative effect on his mind and on his body. And all of this is passed along to every human, all of us, without exception. Nobody can avoid it. But there is another and different, uh, rather another and different, though related, kind of category of sin and guilt. The guilt that's a result of our actions and our behaviors. It is this kind of sin, actions and behaviors, that's being dealt with in Joshua 7. Akan personally committed a trespass against the Lord, and thus only he bears the guilt for it. Unfortunately, while Israel doesn't bear the guilt for that, the heavy burden of the result of a con sin, that's borne by the whole community. That's not my allegorical explanation. That's what the passages say. Now, a con sin is the same kind of sin, behavioral. It's about actions. It's about intentions that the sacrificial system of animal blood could produce forgiveness for most, but not all, trespasses. The sacrificial system, folks, it worked. It wasn't a sham. God ordained it. And those who followed it with a pure heart indeed had the guilt of their actions and their behaviors Removed, I pointed out literally scores of times that in the law, in the scriptures, it says after a proper sacrifice, these words are written there in our scriptures, and he shall be forgiven. But the sacrificial system could not remove the kind of guilt that all of us carry, regardless of our personal behavior. And that is the sin of Adam, the sin that changed the course of human history. Jesus' blood is so holy, so perfect, so powerful, that even the original sin, the sin present in our nature, that can be remedied and forgiven. Bottom line, communal guilt is alive and well. The whole world bears it, <laughs> and the only ones exempt from the consequences of this communal guilt, communal guilt are Yeshua's disciples. Communal, respons communal responsibility, that's alive and well. And the church still bears communal responsibility, right along with everybody else in this world. When a member of the body of which you belong sins, you can bet one way or another you are going to be affected. That membership in a body includes, depending on your situation, your family, your community, your nation, your church or synagogue, whatever body you worship, might worship with. That is why we find Paul telling the Corinthians, drive out a person from the church, a believer who is sinning and won't admit it or won't repent from it because Otherwise, all members of that body is going to become affected. Not guilty, but affected in the form of bearing the burden of that person's sins and guilt. I mean, let's understand the serious of this, seriousness of this situation in Joshua 7. The Lord says that Israel community, uh, communally has broken the covenant with him as a result of Achan's misappropriation of banned goods. And now the $64,000 question facing Joshua and Israel's leaders is, well, then how can Israel restore its covenant relationship with Jehovah now that this has happened? What are we going to do? This is the lesson that the Lord is teaching Joshua. And it's why the story of Achan is, has fascinated, it has informed Jewish and Christian Bible scholars because the means of mankind... Restoring our broken relationship with God is the entire point of salvation and redemption. That's what it's all about. In verse 19, the lot reveals that the criminal is a con. 
And Joshua confronts him. Here's the beginning now of restoration, the confrontation of sin. That's how it begins. Joshua asks Akan, in a rather fatherly way, actually, to confess. And the reason he is asking for Akan's confession is, it says in literal Hebrew, to set forth the glory of Yahweh. Yahweh. In other words, sacred lots, as directed by God, have outed Akan. And Akan needs to publicly confirm, publicly confirm that the Lord has indeed supernaturally revealed the truth, thus further confirming that the Lord's justice is perfect. It shows that nothing can be hidden from the Lord. But notice that confession is the necessary step towards reconciliation with God. Nothing good happens until confession is made. And Akan demonstrates the proper format for confession. It is that whatever acts of lawlessness one commits, it is an act that by definition is against God. If we lie, it's against God. If we steal, it's against God. Therefore, it is to God that we must confess. Now, naturally, as revealed in verses 20 and 21, the items Akan took were because they pleased his eyes. I saw them and I wanted them. He took things that are materially valuable and enticing, and they'd give him personal benefit. The first thing he took was a coat, a robe from Shinar. Shinar was a region of Babylon. It was noted for its extravagancies. This was probably a royal robe. It was probably worth a lot of money. Akan also took a goodly amount of silver and gold, knowing, of course, that he was doing wrong. He knew he was doing wrong when he took those items and hid the items in the ground under his tent. And after Akan confessed, Joshua sent men running to Akan's tent, and indeed there were the items right where Akan said they were. God's holy property lying inside a hole in the ground under a common tent. Now something terrible and instructive happens. Akan, his entire household, his livestock, all of his possessions, and the stolen banned items were taken outside the camp to the valley of Akor, and there all living creatures that were even associated with Akan were killed. Everything Akan owned was burned up with fire, and a mound of stones was placed over the remains. A core is actually a play on words. It means trouble. And since Akan caused such trouble, then Joshua said the penalty would now be trouble upon him. And so the place where this trouble upon troubled Akan occurred was appropriately named trouble. Akar. See, what happened here is that the man, Akan, who stole the van, the items devoted to God, and his family themselves became ban. They became property devoted to God. They became substitutes for the holy property. They were treated like holy properties treated. They were destroyed, and they were burned up with fire as the only prescribed means to give holy property directly to the Lord. Now notice something. In Jericho, everything that was considered spoils of war, ban, was devoted to God. All of it. The people of Israel were to receive nothing of the spoils from Jericho. So we find that the enemy, the people who were barricaded inside of Jericho, were killed, and then everything, people, livestock, their possessions were burned up and left to lie under the stones 
of those collapsed walls of Jericho. So naturally, we see the same pattern as what happened at Jericho was now applied to Akan and his family and his possessions. They became God's enemy due to Akan's sin of stealing the ban, and thus they became ban. They are killed, then they're burned up, and guess what happens? They have stones piled on top of them. You see it? What happened? It just is what happened to the ban at Jericho. This then brings us full circle. Back to the beginning of our lesson when I explained that the holy property that has become holy as a result of it being selected and used for sacrifices to God, animals and produce, is similar in nature to the holy property that is the ban that results from holy war. And there is a peculiar aspect of God's holy property that we've talked about in the past, but it needs to be reviewed. It is that by that calling God's holy property holy is literal. It's not metaphoric. It's not rhetorical. Things devoted to God actually take on a real, literal holiness once God accepts them. And the thing we learned months ago about holy objects and people and impure objects in people is that they can transmit their holiness or their impurity to other people or other objects by contact, and in some cases, by mere proximity. We see this demonstrated in Leviticus, primarily as it pertains to defilement, ritual impurity. That is, for instance, a person contracts zarat, that divinely caused skin disease. Most of your Bibles will call leprosy. It's not leprosy. These people can infect an object. They can infect another person by touching them. Well, if a dead mouse falls into a cooking pot, now that cooking pot contracts ritual impurity, not so much because the mouse touched it, but because it's dead. And death is the worst sort of ritual impurity. Then if something is cooked in that now defiled pot, the food contracts the impurity. Then if somebody eats the impure food, they become impure. This is not a joke. It's not a superstition. It's carefully explained in the Torah and it is a serious problem. And there are several remedies described in the Torah for a person or an object that contracts uncleanness that range from washing with water all the way to being destroyed if the object is too porous. And so it absorbs so much impurity, it can't ever be properly cleaned. But what happens when we're dealing with the opposite end of the scale? What happens when we're dealing not with impurity, but we're dealing with holiness? The answer is that we find that holiness can also indeed be transmitted in the same way as impurity is transmitted by touch. However, God has effectively rendered the possibility of the transmission of holiness to divine theory, so to speak. That's my words. Because he refuses to allow accidental or unauthorized transmission of holiness to ever occur, even though by its nature and spiritual laws, it can happen. Now, don't be confused by this. The concept of the possibility of holiness being transmitted in an unauthorized way, but the Lord never permitting it, is not double talk. It's quite straightforward. As an illustration of how this works, we know that some blood diseases are communicable by touch. If we allowed blood, a diseased blood to touch our skin, or especially to come into contact with an open sore, or a cut, it is possible that we will become infected. However, that possibility can be rendered as mere medical theory if we wear latex gloves and masks and take all the proper precautions, then the spread of that contamination is thwarted. We have a way to take what can happen, but not allow it to happen. Holiness can be spread by touch 
to unauthorized people, to unauthorized objects, but God doesn't allow it. Now, the problem for mankind is that Jehovah's solution and method for controlling unauthorized transmission of holiness is simply to destroy whatever is about to become holy as a result. You don't want to be on the other end of that. In other words, if a tabernacle incense burner used for service to God in the wilderness tabernacle were to be improperly removed, let's say, by someone from the tabernacle that's taken to their tent and it comes into contact with a common cooking pot, by all spiritual laws, that cooking pot could become holy. Whatever is cooked in it would become holy and then be transmitted to whoever ate that food. But the way God handles such a thing is to immediately destroy the cooking pot. And usually the one who facilitated the improper use of God's holy object, thus stopping it before it can happen. We actually watched this exact scenario play out with Aaron's, Aaron was the first high priest of Israel, with Aaron's sons, because they took holy incense burners and put what was called strange fire into them. In other words, they took coals from a common wood fire instead of from the brazen altar, and they laid them upon holy objects that were ordained for service in the tabernacle. What would the Lord do? The Lord burned up the holy instruments and Aaron's sons. Otherwise, holiness would have been transmitted from the holy incense burners to the, these common coals. So God destroyed them. We saw a similar thing later on. Saw it again, because God wants to impress this principle on us, His people. Korah, several men from his clan decided they did not like God's decision of making Aaron's clan the only ones allowed to present holy incense to the Lord. So they brought their personal fire pans from their homes. They filled them with their own coals, their own incense, and they tried to present them to the Lord inside the sacred tabernacle grounds. The proximity to the Lord would have caused His great holiness to transmit to their firepans, making them holy, but without His permission. And so Jehovah just supernaturally burned up those firepans, along with all the men, about 200 of them. So holiness was not transmitted outside of God's control. There's your second example. I, mean, I hope you're starting to see how this applies to our story of Akan. Akan had touched the ban, God's holy property. Akan was theoretically contaminated with a level of holiness to which he was not entitled because it would have transmitted from God's holy property to him. What is always God's solution to this kind of a problem? Destruction of the unauthorized receiver of holiness, whether it's an object or a human. Now, a greater theological problem is to answer why were Khan's family, why all of his possessions, why all of his animals and livestock also burned up? It is possible that his family was complicit in the robbery of God's ban, although there's no indication of that in the Scriptures. But what role did the livestock play? I must say that most reasonable people in a compassionate, knee-jerk reaction see God's destructive response as awfully extreme, pretty merciless, in this situation. So while there's not universal agreement among theologians on this, in general it is thought that the reason for the Lord's severe reaction was that since 
a con touched the holy property, and thus he became contaminated with holiness, he then likely touched his family members, who in turn became contaminated with holiness. They touched their animals. They touched all their personal property. Therefore, everything had become contaminated with unauthorized holiness. And what's the solution for that before God? Total, complete destruction. The burden, not the guilt, the burden of a con's sin had its worst and most devastating effects on his own household. Is that not always the case? Yet it seems as though as we contemplate an action that may well be against the Lord, we just don't consider the many innocent people that we love who might be hurt or even destroyed because of it. Let's move on to Joshua chapter 8. Joshua chapter 8, page 249 if you have a complete Jewish Bible. Joshua chapter 8. Adonai said to Joshua, Do not be afraid or fall into despair. Take all the people who can fight with you, set out, and go up to Ai, because now I have handed over to you the king of Ai, his people, his city, his land. Do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. But this time, take its spoil and booty as bo as, and cattle as booty for yourselves. Ambush the city from behind. So Joshua set out for Ai with all the people who could fight, and Joshua chose 30,000 men, the most courageous of his troops, sent them out by night. And he instructed them, you are to lie and wait to ambush the city from behind. Stay close to the city, all of you, be ready. I and all the troops with me will approach the city, and when they come out to attack us, as they did before, we will run away from them. They will chase after us until we have drawn them away from the city because they'll say they're running away from us just as they did before, so we'll run away from them. Then you will jump up from your ambush position and take possession of the city, for Adonai your God will hand it over to you. When you have captured the city, you're to set it on fire. Do according to what Adonai has said. Those are your orders. And Joshua sent them out, and they went to the place for the ambush, staying between Bethel and Ai, to the west of Ai, while Joshua camped that night with the people. Now Joshua got up early in the morning and mustered his men and went to Ai ahead of the people, he and the leaders of Israel, and all the troops marching with him went up and advanced and arrived in front of the city and camped on the north side of Ai with a valley between him and Ai. Then he took about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of Ai. Thus the people arrayed themselves with all the army to the north of the city and their rear guard lying in wait to the west of the city. Joshua spent that night in the valley. Now the king of Ai saw this. So the men in the city hurried out early in the morning to battle against Israel, he and all his people, at a meeting place facing the Arabah. But he was unaware that behind the city an ambush had been laid against him. Joshua and all Israel made as if they had been defeated before them, and they ran off on the road to the desert. All the people of Ai were summoned together to pursue them, so they chased Joshua, and they were drawn away from the city. And not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who had not gone after Israel. Pursuing Israel, they left the city wide open. Then Adonai said to Joshua, Point the spear in your hand towards Ai, because I will hand it over to you. Joshua pointed the spear in his hand towards the city, and the men in ambush jumped up quickly from their places. The moment he stretched out his hand, they ran, they entered the city, they captured it, and they hurried to set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked behind them, <clears throat> they saw it. There was the smoke from the city rising to the sky, and they had no power to flee this way or that, at which point the people who had run off towards the desert turned back upon their pursuers. And when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had captured the city and that the smoke of the city was going up, they turned back and they slaughtered the men of Ai. 
<clears throat> while the others came out of the city against them too, so that they were surrounded by Israel with some on this side, some on that side. They attacked them, allowing none to remain or escape. But they took the king of Ai alive, and they brought him to Joshua. Well, when Israel had finished slaughtering all the inhabitants of Ai in the countryside, in the desert where they had pursued them, and they had all fallen, consumed by the sword, then all Israel returned to Ai and defeated it with the sword. 12,000 men and women fell that day, everyone in Ai. <coughs> For Joshua did not withdraw his hand, which he had used to point the spear until they had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. Only the livestock and the spoil of that city did Israel take as booty for themselves in keeping with the order Adonai had given to Joshua. So Joshua burned down Ai and turned it into a tell forever, so that it remains a ruin to this day. The king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until evening. At sundown, Joshua gave an order, so they took his carcass down from the tree threw it at the entrance of the city gate and piled on it a big heap of stones, which is there to this day. Then Joshua built an altar to Adonai, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, as Moshe, the servant of Adonai, who had ordered the people of Israel to do. This is written in the book of the Torah of Moses. An altar of uncut stones that no one had touched with an iron tool. On it they offered burnt offerings to Adonai and sacrificed peace offerings. He wrote there on the stones a copy of the Torah of Moses, inscribing it in the presence of the people of Israel. Then all Israel, including their leaders, officials, and judges, stood on either side of the ark in front of the priests who were Levites, who carried the ark for the covenant of Adonai. The foreigners were there along with the citizens. Half of the people were in front of Mount Gerizim, half of them in front of Mount Ebal as Moses, the servant of Adonai, had ordered them earlier in connection with blessing the people of Israel. After this, he read all the words of the Torah, the blessing and the curse, according to everything written in the book of the Torah. There was not a word of everything Moses had ordered that Joshua did not read before all Israel assembled, including the women, the little ones, and the foreigners that were living with them. Akan has been destroyed. The holy property has been returned to God. Justice has been done. Now, restoration has happened. The immutable spiritual principle is sin must be confessed. Then it must be dealt with in order for God's justice to be satisfied. Once God's justice is satisfied, now restoration can happen. It was this same spiritual principle that Yeshua did not come to abolish, but to fulfill on our behalf. It is the use of this ancient spiritual principle that is the only means to our reconciliation with the Father. Thus, with reconciliation and restoration now accomplished, the Lord tells Joshua, do not fear, don't despair. God is telling Joshua that he is going to go back to the place of his defeat. I, But he's not to fear that the same results will happen. And that is because since Joshua and Israel have the burden of a con sin removed off them, now the Lord will again lead the Israeli army to victory. The Lord says that Joshua will now do to the king of Ai and his people what was done to Jericho. But there's going to be one significant difference. God has graciously decided that some of the spoils of war will go to the people of Israel. Some of the spoils of war will not now be set apart and devoted to God, his band. I want to be clear. This means that since God is not asking for some spoils to be set apart to him, therefore those things that he gives to the people did not become holy. They were, not, they were never devoted to him. Now, I want to talk about this for a minute, because if the Lord had given this same instruction to Israel, 
When they attacked Jericho, a con would never have committed a crime against God. What Achan did in Jericho, and he died for it, and it caused Israel the greatest of trouble, is now being permitted at I. Why? When it was wrong before to take some of the spoils, why is it suddenly okay now? Is this simply a matter of God's will being different in different situations? Or is there something more behind this? This is an interesting parallel between the decision of the Lord to allow the people to partake of the spoils, the spoils in one situation, not in another, and the principle of first fruits. And I confess to you, while I'm not quite 100% certain of it, I see this as less of an interesting parallel and more, of a, more as a pattern. That is, it's not that the principle of first fruits is similar to Jericho and I, to the battles that took place there, but that the battles for Jericho and I, as concerns the disposition of the spoils of war, they intentionally follow the God ordained pattern of first fruits. I, th I think you've been taught sufficiently on the principle of first fruits. I don't have to go in depth to review it. But the notion is that the first of everything belongs to God. That's first fruits. Okay. First fruits isn't only referring to fruit trees, the first fruit of the, first of the fruit tree. Fruits is just a biblical term that means that which is produced. It's the results of some kind of a process. Some scholars have taken to use, using the term firstlings. I think that's maybe a better term than first fruits. Because in Western culture, it sounds more broad and universal in its application rather than applying, just thinking of it only as agriculture. Thus, a firstborn is but the human form of first fruits, the first of a man's children. Always a son is to be devoted to God. By way of example, the first lamb of a sheep is always devoted to God. The first income from a job or a trade, always devoted to God. The first produce from a field or a vineyard or an or orchard, always devoted to God. That's the biblical principle. Although the law of first fruits is stated in a number of places in the Torah, and it's applied in a number of passages throughout the Bible, here are a couple that I think sets the foundation for establishing the ordinance of first fruits. Leviticus 23, starting verse 10. Tell the people of Israel, after you enter the land I'm giving you and harvest its ripe crops, you are to bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He's to wave the sheaf before Adonai so that you will be accepted. The priest is to wave it on the day after Shabbat. On the day you wave the, le the sheaf, you are to offer a male lamb without defect in its first year as a burnt offering for Adonai. Its grain offering is to be one gallon of fine flour mixed with olive oil, an offering made by fire to Adonai as a fragrant aroma. Its drink offering is to be of wine, one quart. You are not to eat bread, dried grain, or fresh grain until the day you bring the offering for your God. This is a permanent regulation. Throughout all of your generations, no matter where you live. Then we read in Leviticus 19, 23. When you enter the land and plant various kinds of fruit trees, you are to regard its fruit as forbidden. For three years it will be forbidden to you, and it will not be eaten. In the fourth year, all of its fruit will be holy for praising out an eye. But in the fifth year, you may eat its fruit so that it will produce even more for you. I am Adonai, your God. So the concept is that only after giving God the first of whatever is produced does a man have any right to what's left. Think about that for a minute. But there is another aspect to first fruits that often escapes us in our rather simplistic mindset that probably every believer has uttered at some point in our lives, haven't we all said, oh, everything belongs to God? Do we really believe that? 
Yes, everything belongs to God, but only some things are devoted to God. And by definition, the first fruits of everything are automatically devoted to God. That's the spiritual principle. What does that mean? Well, it means something much stronger and more serious than we might think. The principle that we're seeing play out in Joshua is that things devoted to God, whether it's people, animals, objects, they're God's holy property. God's holy property belongs to God, to God alone. And once it's devoted to Him, no one may make unauthorized use of it without consequence. On the one hand, the ownership of the property has been transferred, so to speak from the worshiper to God. On the other hand, the Lord says that even though the worshiper may not give him the first fruits of everything, even though you may wrongly hold it back, it still belongs to him. Just because you don't give it to him doesn't mean it's not his. It's just that we are misappropriating it. That we might rebel and keep those firstlings for ourselves does not change the fact that those firstlings are already devoted to him from a spiritual aspect. You know why? He's declared it to be so. That is exactly the problem with what Akan did. Even though those banned items ought to have been physically turned over to God, but they weren't because Akan kept them for himself, doesn't mean that from a spiritual perspective that they've somehow lost their holiness and so they no longer belong to God. I think I see the wheels turning, some of your heads here. It's not that the first fruits of our income should be devoted to God. It is that by definition, according to God's universal and unchangeable laws, it already is. It's his. We don't even realize it. It's only a matter of whether we're going to physically turn it over to him or we're just going to misappropriate his holy property, keep it for ourselves. Do you have a firstborn son? That son's already the Lord's. As the first fruit of your loins. It's only a matter of whether you choose to openly devote that son to God and recognize that son's status or deny to God what's his property. See, the thing is, from the big picture standpoint, while indeed everything belongs to God, only the first fruits must be turned over to him because they are holy property. The remainder, generally speaking, he authorizes for our use. When we decide to keep his holy property, it is sin. It's a con sin, and there's going to be consequences. Let's peel this onion back one more layer. Applying the principle of first fruits to Israel being given the land of Canaan, we see that the very first city and land given to Israel was what? Jericho. Right? God's instructions were all the spoils of Jericho were to be his. All of it. Not, not one thing. Nothing could Israel have as their own. This is because, just like the orchard that we read all about in Leviticus 19.23, all of the first crop, all of it, is devoted to God. So the entire first crop is holy property. Therefore, the entire first crop is completely off limits to God's people. However, next year, after God's holy portion is given to him, which is all of it, but now next year, after a tenth of it is given to God, the remainder now can be turned over to the people for their use. So while everything in uh, Jericho was devoted to God because it was the first city 
taken in the promised land, the next city to be taken was I, and with I, only some of the spoils had to be given to God, but the people of God could use the remainder. This simply follows the pattern of first fruits. Do you see it? Are you holding back the first fruits in your life? The first fruits that are already God's holy property. It really doesn't matter whether you agree with God or not about this. He's not looking for your permission. The law of first fruits was, has been set in motion. It can't be altered. It can't be stopped. The first fruits of everything in your life, God has already redeemed or His, and there's not a thing you can do about it. You, holding on to God's holy property, is dangerous. It's very counterproductive, and it's a trespass. It's a sin against Him. Whether it's your income from your work, whether it's your children, whether it's your crops, it's your ministry. It doesn't matter what it is. The first fruits of it already belongs to Him. And if you're just hanging on to it, I suspect there's some things not going too well in your life. When things didn't go too well for Joshua and Israel, what did, what did they do? Joshua and Israel fell on their faces and they whined and they moaned and they asked the Lord, what, what in the world happened here? The Lord responded. He responded by telling them, examine yourselves, don't look at me. This is you. This is not me. It was sin among them. In fact, the sin of how many men? One. One man in the community. One. That was the problem, not God. When Yeshua said, give to God what is God's and give to Caesar what is Caesar's, he didn't say, give it to God so it can become God's. Give it to God so it can become His. No. He said, give to God what is God's. Give to God what is already God's. Because to hold it back is to rob God of His holy property. We'll continue with chapter 8 next week.